Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Before we begin our program, I'd like to let you know that free newsletters are available from our ministry. Just email us at cdebater at aol.com and give us your mailing address and we'll mail them out to you for free. You can also call us at 512-218-8022 and leave your address there. You can also access all our newsletters online by going to one of our three websites called BibleQuery.org. Once on the homepage, simply click on the Experience box and then scroll down to the newsletter section as shown here. Since our number one most watched video of the over 548 videos we have produced for YouTube at the time of this recording is Unpopular Bible Doctrines Number 1, The Biblical God No One Wants to Know, with over 433,000 viewings, our latest newsletter is called Unpopular Topic, How Sovereign is God. Our second most viewed YouTube video is Six-Year-Old Wife of Muhammad Was Okay by the Muslim God Allah, But Not by the Biblical God of Jesus with over 341,000 viewings. We also have three newsletters available on Islam. Our video, Debate, Larry Wessels versus Two Jehovah's Witnesses at a University Study Center, currently has close to 150,000 views. See our newsletter on the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceived Deceivers. Our video, Is Jesus God Almighty in the Flesh, meaning the second person of the Trinity, or is he something else, has over 101,000 viewings. See our newsletter, Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. Our video, Biography, the famous 19th century Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a man of God, has close to 89,000 views. See two of our newsletters with lead articles from sermons by Spurgeon. Our video, UFOs, Ancient Aliens or Beings of the Fourth Dimension, number one, fact or fiction, has over 207,000 viewings. Not only do UFOs and the occult use the same disciplines such as levitation, teleportation of objects, psychokinesis, clairvoyance, automatic writing, and telepathy, but their theologies are completely foreign to biblical Christianity. UFO theologies include everything from reincarnation and evolution to man achieving cosmic godhood but they do not include Jesus Christ as the only mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We have two newsletters related to the world of the occult to which UFOs are a part. Our video, Former Roman Catholic Bride of Christ Nun Testifies of Abnormal Life in the Convent, has over 67,000 viewings. Our video featuring former Roman Catholic Rob Zins, who has a Master of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, historical split between Roman Catholicism and the Christ of the Scripture, man's word or God's word, has over 53,000 viewings. See our two newsletters on the subject of Roman Catholicism. Our video, Cult of Ellen G. White, number one, Beginnings of the 19th century religion, called Seventh-day Adventism, has over 48,000 viewings and features former Seventh-day Adventist Wallace Slattery, who has 44 years' experience with this religion. Our playlist, called Dealing with Seventh-day Adventism and Their Prophetess, features 15 videos with 14 hours of material. See our newsletter, Seventh-day Adventism, True or False. For theological music lovers, see our video, Favorite 
old time Christian bluegrass gospel music, Psalm 98 verses four and five. With over 214,000 viewings, we have also posted several music videos by my own daughter, Marlena Wessels, from her CD, Win This Fight, songs she has written and performed herself. To see our music videos, please go to our main YouTube channel page. Scroll down to our multiple playlists. Arrow over to our playlist called Our Radio Shows with National Christian Authors and Music Vids. Once there, scroll down to the bottom of the playlist where the music videos are listed. I could go on and on, but this should be sufficient for now. Don't forget to check out our main YouTube channel, See Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television, also which has over 19 playlists by topic as you scroll down our channel page. Now, on with our main presentation. This morning we're to talk about Abraham's Four Seeds. And this is a book that has 86, eight and a half by 11 pages in it, and we're to give you a summary of it in an hour. I doubt if we'll succeed. Somebody said, how long does it take you to prepare a sermon? And I said, some of them take about 30 years. <laughs> this one took about 20. <clears throat> the book, Abraham's Four Seeds, on the bottom of it, it says this, an examination of the basic presuppositions of covenant theology and dispensationalism as they relate to the promise of God to Abraham and his seed. Abraham is one of the most important men in the scriptures and one of the most important covenants and promises in the scriptures is the covenant that God made with Abraham and his seed. And of course the great question is who is Abraham's seed and exactly what is the promise which is made to that seed? And it depends upon your basic presuppositions where you will come out. And everybody has basic presuppositions. That means you presuppose some things as true, except those without arguments. One of the Christian's basic presuppositions is he believes the Bible is the word of God. And he believes that he can trust it to give him the answers of reality. And he commits himself to that. If that's true, then we are right for time and eternity. If that's wrong, then as Paul says, we are of all men most miserable. If the Bible is not true, if Jesus did not rise again from the dead, then the most stupid people in Austin are you people listening to me, and I'm a liar and giving false truth. So everything depends upon that presupposition. The non-Christian says, no, the Bible is not true. It has myths in it and so on and so forth, and it is not his final authority. He himself is the final judge of truth. He is his ultimate God. If he is wrong in that, then he's wrong in every single thing in his life. That's why the book of Proverbs says that even the plowing of the wicked is sin. It does not mean it's a sin to plow, but it does mean that a man plows because he believes there's going to be a summer and a winter and a spring. He, there's going to be a rain, there's going to be sun. His very plowing is an exhibition of his faith in the God of seasons. And yet in his heart, he rejects that God, but he acknowledges him and he's forced to acknowledge him. If it doesn't rain, then he curses God. If it rains and he has a good crop, he doesn't thank God. So that his very plowing is sinful because he does it from a wrong presupposition. He does it from a wrong motive and a wrong heart. Now, in Genesis chapter 17, and also Genesis 15, you have <coughs> a covenant promise of Abraham. And look at Genesis chapter 17 first. Genesis chapter 17, and verse 7 and 8. Genesis 17, verse 7, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generation, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land 
wherein thou art a stranger all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. In Genesis 15, the specific boundaries of this land is clearly laid out. And the heart of the covenant promise to Abraham all the way through the old scriptures is the land. And that's the thing that keeps being repeated over and over again in the later prophets and in the Psalms. If one had nothing but the Old Testament scriptures to read, he would clearly come to the conclusion that the land of Palestine is promised to the nation of Israel unconditionally and eternally, if that's all he had was the Old Testament scriptures. But we have the New Testament scriptures as well. Now, verse 7 is the verse that is picked up by the covenant theologian. I will be a God to thee and to thy seed or thy children after thee. Verse 8 is the verse which the dispensationalists picked up concerning the land. So both dispensationalism and covenant theology both use the identical promise that God made an unconditional covenant with Abraham and the one says that that covenant seed is Israel and the other says that covenant seed is the children of believing parents. And the one says the land is the essence of the promise and the other one says inclusion in the covenant of grace is the promise. But both of them use the same text to prove the same thing. And the dispensationalists will go back to this and that's why his insistence that the land will be uh, enjoyed by and occupied by the nation of Israel. Some say it will be eternally and others say it will only be for a thousand years. And the covenant theologian goes to the book of Acts and uses this to prove his infant baptism on the basis of this promise and the promises unto you and to your seed. And uh, that's what they use to prove this. <clears throat> uh, we're going to deal a little bit with the covenant idea of believers and their seed being the children of believing parents and infant baptism in this message today. Just touch on it for a bit. The first thing we establish is that our view of Abraham and the promise that God made to him and his seed is neither one of those things, and I think we can prove that beyond question. If you go to the book of Galatians chapter 3, and this is one of those very key verses of Scripture, especially in this subject. And in the book of Galatians, Paul is raising the question, what was the purpose and function of the law? Why did God give the law at Mount Sinai? And what is the relationship of that law at Mount Sinai to the promise that God made to Abraham? Is God changing horses in the middle of the stream when he gives a covenant which is obviously of a different type and nature than the covenant made with Abraham? And so we read in verse uh, 15 of Genesis, uh, or Galatians chapter 3, verse 15, <clears throat> Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now this is a basic presupposition. Once a covenant is entered into, even a man's covenant, that covenant cannot be changed unless both parties agree to the change. If you contract to have your house painted for X number of dollars and the conditions of the kind of paint and so on, that can't be changed arbitrarily by you or by the painter. And so here's the principle. Once a covenant is struck, that covenant is enforced and it can't be added to. So you can't take the Mosaic covenant and say, well, this is an addendum which is added to the Abrahamic covenant because it would contradict this verse of Scripture. Verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And he saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. When I was in Bible school, we studied the book of Galatians, and we came to this verse, and I asked the professor, to explain this, what was Paul saying, and I was doing it in absolute ignorance. I wasn't doing it to ruffle the guy up, but he couldn't answer it, and, and he really got angry. In fact, he dismissed the class early, and I didn't know why he was angry. All I wanted to know was what the text meant, and he couldn't tell me. 
because he really didn't honor it himself. And what Paul is saying here is that I don't care what you believe about that Abrahamic covenant, the seed to whom that promise was made cannot be plural. It has to be singular because that's Paul's whole argument here. He says there wasn't a promise of Abraham and his seed made to plural seeds, but to one specific seed, and that seed is Jesus Christ. So the promise of Abraham and his seed cannot be the Jewish people. It cannot be Israel. That's plural. It cannot be Christian parents and their children. That's plural. It has to be Jesus Christ. And Christ himself is the promise. And salvation through him is the great promise that's made to Abraham and brought down through the scriptures. And it's really nothing less than the gospel of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's our view of understanding this. <clears throat> no one, Jew or Gentile, in any dispensation under any covenant, has ever received or ever will receive a spiritual blessing apart from being united to Jesus Christ. And he will never, ever, any person receive a spiritual blessing apart from personal repentance and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody, because of the color of his skin or because of some ordinances that were performed on him, will ever be in a separate category before God spiritually or ever receive a spiritual blessing just because of his skin, just because of his birth, just because of his heritage, just because of some ceremony that was performed on him. It will always be because of the sovereign electing grace of God and the application of the gospel to that heart and repentance and faith wrought in that individual. Now, that was the great mistake of the Jews. The great mistake of the Jews was they believed that God loved the Jews just because they were Jews, irrespective of the way they lived, and he hated the Gentiles just because they were Gentiles, irrespective of the way they lived. And that was utter nonsense. But that's what they truly believed. Now, the Jews were not in a separate category before God spiritually, but they were in a separate category before God nationally. They had privileges that no other nation had. They were dealt with God. They were covenantally related to God as no other nation ever was or ever will be, but that didn't mean that they were spiritually in a separate category before God. And Paul's great argument in Romans chapter 2 and 3 deals with this very thing. In Romans chapter 2, uh, he says, you have the law and you rest in the law. And they did. They had the law as no other nation had. They said you could instruct people and they could. They knew what was right and wrong. They had the revelation of God. But they trusted that because they had that revelation, therefore they obeyed that revelation. But they didn't. He said, you also trust in your heritage. You're a Jew, and you're one of the chosen people. And they were Jews, and they were the chosen people, and they did have privileges that no other nation had. And then lastly, he said, you rest in your circumcision. You bear the very mark of God's covenant sign, but you're guilty before God. And then the great question in Romans chapter 3, which is the logical question, what then is the profit of having circumcision? If that doesn't make us acceptable to God, if that doesn't put us in a separate category, what's the use of having the law, being born a Jew, and having circumcision? And Paul says, much in every way. Now notice he doesn't say, this puts you in a separate category. But he says it gives you great advantages. When what are those advantages? Because unto you were committed the oracles of God. The great blessing of the Jewish nation was they had the gospel preached to them as no other nation did. God just wrote the other nations off, so to speak, and left them in ignorance. But he chose this nation and revealed the gospel to them. And according to Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, they didn't believe that gospel, and they rested in their own works. The exact same thing is true of a Christian parent's child. Is that child greatly blessed of God because he's born in a Christian home? Yes. Does that make him in a separate category and does his baptism somehow put him in a covenant of grace? No. Great advantages and therefore greater condemnation, but not 
a separate category. And you see, the one thing the Jew hated through the ministry of Paul is there is no difference. You see, there was a great difference between Jew and Gentile before the coming of Christ. No longer is there a difference. And see, they said, no, 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 we are the covenant people of God. And that's the exact same objection that the covenant theologian makes. Don't tell me that my children are the same as every other child. And we say, yes, they are. There is no difference. They have great privileges, but they are just as much a child of wrath as that boy or girl in Africa or India. And apart from their personal repentance and faith, they are lost and they have no special privileges. They have great advantages, but nothing that puts them in a separate spiritual category before God. Now, it's very obvious that everything hinges on who is Abraham's seed. Is it really the children of Christian parents? Is it really the Jews? Do they really have a claim to the land today? Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, our view is that both of those are wrong. That Jesus Christ himself is the seed and the promises made to seed singular. Now, in our book, we, we mentioned that there are four distinct seeds of Abraham in the scriptures. And it's a failure to delineate these four seeds and then list the promises which were made to each seed that causes the problem. And people just loosely say the promise to Abraham's seed. And we have to say, no, wait a minute, which one? The first seed of Abraham is his natural seed. And that would include Ishmael. That would include Esau. In other words, everybody who is a natural seed of Abraham is Abraham's seed. And the promises which were made to Abraham, those same identical promises were made to Ishmael. And they were both made, and they were both circumcised the same day. The only difference is Ishmael was not promised in thy seed, <laughs> Will the Messiah come? But the rest of it, the land, be a great blessing, be great nation, all those things are true of Ishmael. So there is a natural seed. But then there's secondly a special natural seed. And that is the nation of Israel. And we have to remember they are a natural seed. Even though they're in a special category, they're not like the rest of the nations. They have a covenant, they have revelation, but they are still unregenerate. Most of them died and went to hell. And so they were still only the natural seed. One of the things that theologians don't bring into this discussion is that in the book of Galatians chapter 4, the apostle argues, who was your mother? <laughs> you remember he talks about Sarah and Hagar, these two women, they both have the same husband, and they both beget children, but the one child is rejected because he's born after the flesh. The other is accepted because he's born after the spirit. And then he says, these two women are types of the two covenants. And so he's saying, just as Abraham had two sons, God gave two covenants. One to Abraham and, and one to the nation of Israel. And then he says, the nature of the mother determines the nature of the child. And because Sarah was a free woman, she can beget a free child who will get the inheritance. And because Hagar is a bondmaid, she can only produce a slave child who has to be cast out. So the question is not who is your father, because Ishmael has as much claim as that, the Arabs have as much claim as that, as the Jew or the Christian. The question is who is your mother? Have you been begotten by grace or have been begotten by law? And so when he says, cast out this bondwoman, he's really saying, cast out the old covenant. And when he says, cast out her child, Ishmael, he's saying, cast out everything that's begotten by that old covenant, because that which is born of the flesh is flesh and cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So there is a special natural seed that does have promises that no other nation has, but it's still a natural seed. And then you have the spiritual seed of Abraham, and the spiritual seed of Abraham is all believers of all ages. And the old covenant believers were just as much a part of the family of God as you and I are today. 
They were born by the Spirit of God. They put faith in the gospel promise, and they were justified by faith. They did not have many of the same privileges that we have because they were not given the gift of the Spirit to indwell them. They were just as eternally secure in their faith as you and I are, but they had no way of knowing it because they didn't have the book of Ephesians and they didn't have the book of Romans. And they couldn't take Romans 5.1, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God and we have access into the presence of God. They didn't have that access as long as the veil was standing. They could not read the book of Ephesians and say, I am seated together with Christ. I am identified with him in his death and his burial and his resurrection and his ascension. I am at the right hand in him. Those things had not yet taken place historically, so there were, could be no possible understanding and experiencing of them, even though the reality of that fact was theirs. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, your, your, your faith cannot supersede the knowledge that you have from God, and they didn't have the same knowledge we have. Now, you read dispensational writers, and you would swear that that Israelite sat in his tent, and he had the Schofield reference Bible. <laughs> and then you read Covenant Theologians, and you would swear that they believed that that Israelite sat in his tent, and he read John Murray's book on redemption, redemption accomplished and applied. Well, you see, he didn't have either one. And so you have to take his experiential reality with the knowledge that he had at that time. So the spiritual seed of Abraham is believers of all ages. They will ultimately be the one true bride of Christ. They are the one election of grace. And then the last seed, the fourth seed, of course, is Jesus Christ himself, and he's the unique seed. So you have a natural seed, all of his children, this special natural seed that separates Israel from the others, and then you have the true spiritual seed, the believers of all ages, and then you have Jesus Christ as the unique seed. And it's this unique seed that you have to see. And seeing this unique seed is seeing the gospel promise. Everybody agrees that Genesis 3.15 is the first announcement of the coming of Christ in the scriptures. The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. If that's the first promise, where's the second promise, the third promise, the fourth promise? How do you trace the gospel down through the Old Testament? And, of course, you trace it down through the Old Testament in that word seed. That's the key to understanding. Seed. The seed. In the book of Galatians, chapter 6, the apostle Paul says that God preached the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's a quotation from Genesis, chapter 12, verse 3. So when I read Genesis 12 and God says to Abraham, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed, according to the Apostle Paul, I'm hearing God say, believe in the coming Messiah, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when David is told, I'll raise up thy seed to sit on thy throne, I am to hear him saying, I will raise up Christ to sit on your throne. So whenever we read the promise of that seed, we are reading the promise of the coming of Jesus Christ because he himself is the seed. Now, first of all, he is the seed who was purposed. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, before the foundation of the world, God purposed to slay his son. And that's the place to begin your understanding of theology that God has one eternal unchanging purpose and that involves the death of his son on the cross of Calvary. Secondly, you have this seed predicted in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. Now, I use the word predicted because, as I mentioned last night, this is not a promise to Adam. It wasn't spoken to Adam. It was spoken to Satan. So here you have the coming of Christ clearly predicted. And then in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, you have this seed promised. And he's promised to Abraham. In thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's saying Jesus Christ is coming. He is the seed who is pledged. And that comes down to David, where David is pledged that when he goes into the ground, he will not stay in the ground, but he will be raised from the dead 
even as his seed will be raised from the dead and sit in his throne. And so he's the seed of the woman, he is the seed of Abraham, and he's also the seed of David. And then he is the seed who is pictured. And all the pictures that you have of the seed in the Old Testament, as Randy mentioned in Luke chapter 24, my, what a Sunday school lesson that would be to have the Savior take the Old Testament scriptures and open them up and show how that they all were pictures of him. And to take that picture book and say, now this depicted this and this depicted this, and yet that's what the Old Testament is about. <clears throat> Don't ever confuse this. Don't ever think that the Old Testament is just a book about laws or it's a book about history. It is all of those things, but it's first and foremost a book about Jesus Christ. He is the seed who is pictured in every page of the Bible. And then the next thing is, he's the seed who is presented. And he is presented to us, he's presented to Israel, he's presented to the Gentiles, he's presented to the world as the fulfillment of every promise that God made to the prophets of old. And here is the seed who has now come. And then the next thing is, he is the seed who, he is, the seed who is positioned with authority. He's the seed who's been exalted at the right hand of God the Father. And that's what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Know assuredly, this same Jesus whom you crucified, he's been raised from the dead, he's been given all power and all authority. And then the last thing about this seed is he's the seed who is proclaimed. And our preaching of the gospel to lost sinners is preaching that Jesus Christ is the seed who is the savior of sinners who was promised in Genesis 3.15, who was foreordained before the world began, who was pictured all the way through the scriptures, and now he's here, he has come. Now, one of the first questions is, what is so important about this guy Abraham and his seed? Well, the importance of Abraham, we ask ourselves these questions. When God called Abraham, and when he made promise to him, was God starting an entirely new program that has its beginning here with Abraham? And he's choosing out a special people who are going to be his earthly people and who are going to have earthly promises. And this is going to be his purpose. And when he comes to the New Testament, they reject this kingdom and now it's postponed, but he's going to take up with this purpose again at his second coming. Is that what God is doing in Genesis 12? Is he beginning a new purpose and a new program with a new people? Or, or is God taking the first step to fulfill the promise which he's already made in Genesis 3.15? And is the significance of Abraham not that he's the father of the nation of Israel or not that he's the father of believers, but that he's the father of the nation that's going to bring forth the Messiah? And is Abraham's whole importance tied up with Jesus Christ? And when Christ comes as the fulfillment of the promise of the true seed of Abraham, is this the end of the promise? Or has it been postponed? Now, if you believe in the postponement theory <clears throat> that Christ came and offered the kingdom, the Jews rejected, it's been postponed, and it's going to be set up again. If you believe that when you preach it, at least make sure you don't downplay the church. Because I hear people preaching about the future of Israel. And they talk about all the great things that's going to happen. And it reminds me of a football game. And the first half is over and the teams have gone into the locker room to rest. And now the band is playing and nobody's watching him. And they may have some tumblers out there or something like this. But nobody's paying attention. Everybody's going to the bathroom. Getting kids, and everybody say, wait till the second half starts. Lord, then that's going to be great. My friend, there's nothing God's ever done that's greater than the church of Jesus Christ. And don't ever make it second rate. And don't ever make the idea that the future is going to show the greatness of God's power and glory in the nation of Israel. No, no, it will never, ever, even if there's a millennium, and even if the Jews inherit the land, nothing is going to be more glorious and greater than what God has done in Jesus Christ for poor sinners like you and like me. So 
So I asked the question, what is the significance of this guy Abraham? That God's doing a separate purpose, a separate people, starting something new, or is he just carrying out this one purpose? And now he's taking the first step and choosing the man who's going to be the father of the nation that's going to bring forth this Messiah. Now the book of Acts chapter 2 is a very crucial passage of scripture. If you want to look at that passage with me for a moment. And it's crucial because this is the bridge between the old and the new. And when Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost, he is proclaiming that what God promised to the fathers is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And he does this two ways. He shows that the events of the day of Pentecost, the tongues, the miraculous, is the proof of the fulfillment of a promise that God made to Joel. And he quotes the prophecy of Joel. And this is what he quotes when he says, As it, this is that which is promised, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, Joel pictured a time when the gospel was going to be for whosoever will, not just Jews, not just Gentiles. And Peter is saying on the day of Pentecost, that promise is fulfilled. And the greatest thing that happened on the day of Pentecost was that the gospel was preached, not in Hebrew, but in 16 languages. You know, you'd have never had a problem with the gift of tongues in a Jewish congregation. <laughs> because tongues were not a sign to believers. It was a sign to unbelievers, according to Paul. And the day of Pentecost was God saying, no longer is it Jew only, but now the gospel is to the whole world and 16 languages hear the gospel in their own tongue. The day of Pentecost was the public rejection of God of the Jewish nation and opening up the gospel to the Gentiles. And that proclamation, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the proof of that was the tongues. The proof of that was the Gentiles hearing the gospel, not in the sacred Hebrew language, but in their own language. And then the second thing he does is he shows that the promise made to David. Why is this going on? Why, why are these people speaking in tongues? What's going on here? Well, there's somebody at the Father's right hand, and he has shed forth this. He sent the Spirit. He's now been acclaimed to be Lord. He's earned the right to be Lord and King, and he's earned the right to send the Spirit. And so these things that are happening are the proof that the kingdom of Joel has come and that Jesus Christ is on the throne of David and he's fulfilling the very promise that was made to David many years ago. Now, I think this is clear. But then everything I believe is clear. <laughs> A lady said to me one time, she says, you think you're right in everything you believe. I said, of course I do. So do you. She says, why, well, I do not. I said, well, tell me something you believe you know is false. <laughs> Everybody believes that everything they believe is right. That's why they believe it. Now, if we have any maturity in common sense, we know that mixed up in there, there are some things that aren't right. We just don't know which ones they are. When we're convinced of them, we discard them, and some of us have done that more than one time. Is that right? Amen. But as I say, this is as clear to me as possibly can be. Now, I don't know why any Pado baptist would ever use Acts chapter 2, <coughs> verse 36 through 39, to prove infant baptism. I just cannot understand that. That, to me, is one of the most, most amazing things that I ever heard. Look at that passage of Scripture. Acts chapter 2. Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. Verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The promise is to you and to your children. Do, 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 little drops of water. <laughs> Can you look at that passage of Scripture and get that out of it? What does that passage of Scripture have to do with infant baptism? It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. We have an appendix in Abraham's four seeds. Let me read a couple of sentences to you. <clears throat> For the promises to you and to your children to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Consider a few obvious objections to using this as a proof text for infant baptism. First of all, Peter is speaking to unbelievers, not Christian parents. <laughs> How can you get a promise to Christian parents out of a word to unbelievers? Because it says they were pricked in their hearts and they said, what must we do to be saved? That's lost people. And he says, repent and believe for the promise. That's not to a Christian parent. It is the promise of Joel. It's the promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. It's the promise of the gospel. And this promise of the gospel is to you. It's also to your children. It's also to those who are far off. No, no, my friends, you cannot take a proclamation of the gospel to unbelievers and somehow turn it in to a promise that your children are in the covenant. The unbelievers were asking and so when he says the promise is to you, he's talking specifically and categorically to the unbelievers who ask, what must we do when they heard the gospel preached to them? The promise is the gospel. The promise is the seed has come. The promise is the prophecies are fulfilled. That's the promise. Now, the promise in... Joel is quoting whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and is no way connected with infant baptism. In fact, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, Paul also quotes the book of Joel, chapter 32, when he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he shows that that promise is nothing less than the gospel. See, one of the problems with using this passage for a infant baptism is you lose the gospel to the world. And it is no accident that infant baptism has a tendency to be light on evangelism of the lost. Because you see, you have this concept in your mind, here are these children who are covenant children. They're born in a covenant home, and they're signed with the sign of the covenant. And over here is these pagan children. Well, they're not in the covenant. They're not covenant children. If they were, why weren't they born in a covenant home where they belong? And so you wind up, you have two Gospels, one Gospel for the covenant child and one Gospel for the non-covenant child. The children of believers have no more a unique promise in this passage of Scripture than does anybody else. Look at the passage. The promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't forget that. Not that your children are in the covenant. Nothing in there about that. The promise is to you. Who's that? Well, that's these unconverted and convicted sinners who are crying out, what must I do to be saved? It's not to Christian parents at all. And look at the second part. This promise is to you and to your children. Well, what promise is to your children? That you're in the covenant? No. If you believe, you will be saved. The same gospel that's preached to a Christian pair, I'm mean, to a, a pagan, is also going to be preached to his children if they will believe the gospel. You remember that Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. You see there, the house is going to be saved. Do you mean that your children are going to be saved just because you're saved? And they're going to be saved on the basis of your faith? 
No, no, all he's saying is this promise. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Your children, if they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they shall be saved because the promise is to you and to your children. Do you see that? They want to get the household baptisms to prove there were children, the flipping jailer. See, surely there must have been one wee babe in that household. That's what the Lutheran said to the Anabaptist. He says, my dear brother, surely you believe there must have been one wee child in that jailer's household. And the Anabaptist says, no, the youngest child in that household was a 12-year-old boy. And the Lutheran got his Bible and opened up to Acts chapter 2, and he says, you show me, I mean, Acts chapter 16, he says, you show me where there was a 12-year-old boy in that household. The Anabaptist says, it's in the same verses that we babe. <laughs> Listen to me, my friend. I do not have to prove there were no babies in the household because I'm not, that's not my argument to prove there weren't any there. If you want to use that passage to prove infant baptism, you're the one who has to prove there was a baby there. I don't have to prove there wasn't. I don't have to prove there weren't any red-headed grandmothers in there. You can claim there were. That doesn't make it so. Look at the text. The promise is to you. It's to your children. It's the same as Acts chapter 16. It's whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then look at the next phrase. The promise is to you, unconverted man, and to your children, if they will believe, and to those who are afar off. Who's that? That's the heathen. Do you see in that passage of Scripture that your children have no more a specific promise than do the heathen who are afar off? That's election. Infant baptism destroys the doctrine of election. It turns it on its ear. When you use this text to prove it, because the promise is whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you compare very carefully Joel chapter 2, verse 32, and Acts chapter 2, verse 39, and put them side by side, the one will say, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in Acts it will say, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off. And that's saying the same thing. Who is the whosoever will? It's you, it's your children, it's those who are far off. It's whosoever will. Now, Peter interprets these words, whosoever, in the end of the verse, in the remnant shall be to whom shall call upon the Lord. And Peter interprets that as many as shall call upon the Lord. The remnant is as many, the elect of the grace of God. Now, you see, this idea of no difference, no difference, that's paramount. Romans chapter 9 is a very key passage of Scripture when we start talking about seeds and the seed of Abraham and who should have the rights. Look at Romans chapter 9 with me for just a moment. I remember the promises to Abraham and his seed. Romans chapter 9. Verse 6, it's not as though God's word has failed or taken none effect, for they're not all Israel or Israel. We'll come back to this. Neither because of the seed, that is the children of Abraham, are they all really true children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. In other words, physical birth has nothing whatsoever to do with whether you're a seed. It's whether you're a child of the promise. You see that? That's his whole argument here. Neither because of the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah will have a son. And this coming of God 
is the coming in power to enliven a dead womb that can't get pregnant and enliven a man's body that cannot have a father and enliven them both so that a child is begotten. And that child is born miraculously in fulfillment of a promise and by faith. And I say it reverently, two people who couldn't make love physically made love in faith and had a child named Isaac. And if you're here a Christian, if you're a Christian here this morning, that's exactly what happened to you. You are just as much as a miraculous child then was Isaac because God came and enlivened your dead heart and opened blind eyes and deaf ears and begot in you a new creation. Is that right? Ooh. Ooh. I love that text in Genesis 21 it says and God came at the set time of which he had spoken and did exactly what he said and after all the nonsense that Sarah and Abraham and begetting Isaac and she said well wait a minute but Isaac you, you got to remember Isaac wasn't the seed of Sarah too so Paul goes on in verse 10 he says okay not only this not only this but Rebecca also conceived by one even by our father now, th th this was really totally different situation for the children being not yet born neither having done any good or evil that the purpose of God according to election might stand or might be demonstrated, proven that it's not of works but of him that called it. It was said to her, the elders shall serve the younger as is written, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Well, who is this Jacob and Esau? They are the twin sons of Isaac. And who is Isaac? He is the miraculous born child of Abraham according to the promise listen to me if there were ever two blue blood covenant children it's Jacob and Esau they are Abraham's grandsons they are right in line as covenant children and God hated one covenant child am I right when any Pato Baptist talks about children be in the covenant ask him if Esau was in the covenant because he was whatever covenant you want to make it but he wasn't in the covenant of grace no 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 you see what Paul is doing here he is forever saying it has nothing to do with birth nothing to do with birth you see, chapter 9 follows chapter 8. Boy, that's profound, isn't it? What a profound statement. <laughs> chapter 8 is the great doctrine of assurance. From beginning to end, it's assurance. No condemnation, no separation, because there is no accusation against us. And he winds up that great chapter in chapter 8 saying, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor powers nor so on and so on, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ. And what he's saying is no person can ever be in a saving covenantal relationship with God and ever be lost. It's absolutely impossible. Wait a minute, Paul. What about the nation of Israel? Were they not in covenant relationship with God? And were they not cast off and God turned to the Gentiles? And Romans chapter 9 is written to answer that obvious objection. And what is Paul's answer to this objection? What about the Jewish nation? And his answer is this, not all Israel is Israel. His answer is this, God has never been in any kind of of a gracious saving covenantal relationship with any nation including the nation of Israel you see that's his answer look at verse 1 I say the truth in Christ I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continually sorrow in my heart I could wish myself accursed for from Christ for my brethren my kinsmen according to faith 
who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, whose over all God blessed forever. Amen. And they had all of these things and were still lost. Why? Verse 6, not as though the word of God had taken none effect. It's not a failure in God's part. It's not a failure that God didn't keep his covenant promise. No, no. For not all Israel is Israel. And what's he saying? Is He's saying that God never made any kind of a saving, gracious covenant. He only makes this with his elect, the true seed. And that has nothing whatsoever to do with physical birth. And he proves it by showing that Abraham's two grandsons, twin grandsons, both with the same mother, both signed with the same sign, one is rejected as reprobate and the other is accepted. Why? In order to show that election, not physical birth, not circumcision, not baptism, has anything whatsoever to do with salvation. Do you see this? This is important. There is no difference. There was a great difference. No longer is there any difference whatsoever now. I think this chapter kills both the dispensationalist and I think it kills covenant theology. The same as Hebrews 8 totally destroys both of them. What we're trying to say is that the Bible is a book about Jesus Christ. It's not a book about the Jews. It's not a book about Christians and their children. It's a book about Jesus Christ. And the Old Testament, you can take the Bible and say, it is one story. It has one motif that runs all the way through it. And it's a story about one person, the seed, the seed. And Jesus Christ is the seed, and he's the person. He's the hero of the whole book. And you can divide up this this story of this person into three chapters, or if you want to think of it as a play, and it has, it has three sections, part one, part two, part three. And the first act of this play is the whole Old Testament. And the whole theme is someone's coming. <laughs> and there's this expectation, there's this looking forward. You read it on every page. The seed of the woman is coming. He's the seed of Abraham. He's the seed of David. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior of poor sinners. He's going to come and fulfill everything. Someone's coming. And the first actors on the stage, Genesis 3.15, announce this theme of this part of the story. Someone is coming. The seed of the woman. The second act of the play is the four Gospels. And now the theme is Behold, somebody's here. <laughs> and now the whole theme is this one who was promised has come. And he's now here. And again, the first actors on the stage set the scene for the whole second act of the play. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The proclamation is not behold the one who's come to restore the land. It's behold the one who's come who's going to be the world's savior. In fulfillment of Joel, someone's here. And then the third act of the play goes from the book of the Acts to the end of the book of the Revelation. And now what's the theme? Behold, somebody's coming again. And it's the same person. It's the same seed. And again, the actors are the first actors on the stage. They, they set the scene and those angels say, why stands you here gazing? The same Jesus that you see taken among you, he's coming again. And that theme runs all the way through the Acts and the Epistles to the very last, next to the last verse in the Bible when John on the Isle of Patmos, banned for his faith, cries out, even so come Lord Jesus. My dear friend, that's the story of the Bible. That's the story of the seed. That's the story of the one unchanging purpose of God. And don't muddle it up with two persons and two peoples and two programs. And don't muddle it up with getting lineage to parents and children involved in it. Let it stand as the story of a person and the election of grace, his sheep which were given to him of his father. And some of those sheep are black and some are yellow and some are white and some are whatever other color there is. Is that right? And he will take in the same home 
and save one and leave another. Is that right? And it's his sovereign right to do so. Nobody has a claim on him. We need to learn that. You remember he came to his hometown in that passage in Luke? <laughs> and his hometown people said, hey, you've done a lot of miracles all over. We're your hometown people. Show us some, man. Put on a display. You owe us. We're your hometown people. Remember that? And he told them two stories. Two stories they knew from childhood. Two stories they learned in their Sabbath school. They knew by heart. Never told them one thing new they didn't know before. And they were so mad they wanted to kill him. Right before that they said, My, isn't he wonderful? They hung on every word. Now they're ready to kill him. And what were the two stories? There were many widows. And God came to one election and that one wasn't even a Jewish she was a Gentile <laughs> and there were many lepers <laughs> and God came to one election and he wasn't even a Jew he was a Gentile and they wanted to kill him because of election no no we be Abraham's seed no no we have the law no no we be circumcised I don't owe you anything because I've never entered into a spiritual saving covenant relationship with anybody at any time in history apart from Jesus Christ my son and those to whom I have given him. That's the story of the scriptures. And I'm done. <laughs> Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the holy scriptures. We thank you that there is a unity. There are things that we don't understand. But once we see Jesus Christ, and we see that everything is yes, yes in him, and we see he's the one who's promised, he's the one who's pictured, he's the one who's expected, he's the one who's proclaimed, he's the one who's at your right hand, he's all in all. Then we at least have a key to understanding scriptures, Christ himself. There are many things that we may differ on, even we who are here. But there's one thing that's sure, our affections are on the same person, and we pray that you'd help us to ever keep that. That wherever we find men and women who have the marks and the smell of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they're our brothers, they're our sisters. That there is not a member of the body of Christ who is my enemy. Even though he may treat me as his, I cannot and will not treat him as anything other than my brother in Christ if he belongs to you. And though we misunderstand some things, we pray that you would teach us. And we would not pretend that we have arrived. We are yet all of us pilgrims, all still struggling, all still learning. We are helpers of men's faith, and there are some who are helpers of our faith. We pray that those things that we learned this weekend would help, first of all, our own personal Christian life would help us as husbands and wives, would help us to realize that we're not under the slavishness and the fear of law, that we serve out of the newness of heart, that we serve because we love and we live because of election. We live because of grace and will die in grace. Help us to believe these things and seal them into our very being. Bless now as we disperse to the various places that we shall eat and bless our food and our fellowship around the table and bring us back to again hear your word preached for Christ's sake. Amen. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, 
vessel to you, waiting to hear from you. Jesus is and others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -S -E -S -S -E in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at AOL.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours.